Section 11 of On the Sublime. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. On the Sublime by Longinus. Translated by H. L. Havel. Chapters 31 and 32. Chapter 31. There is a genuine ring in that line of Anacreons, the Thracian filly I no longer heed. The same merit belongs to that original phrase in Theophrastus. To me, at least, from the closeness of its analogy, it seems to have a peculiar expressiveness, though Cecilia censures it without telling us why. Philip, says the historian, showed a marvellous alacrity in taking doses of trouble. We see from this that the most homely language is sometimes far more vivid than the most ornamental, being recognized at once as the language of common life, and gaining immediate currency by its familiarity. In speaking, then, of Philip as taking doses of trouble, Theopompus has laid hold on a phrase which describes with peculiar vividness one who for the sake of advantage endured what was base and sordid with patience and cheerfulness. The same may be observed of two passages in Herodotus. Cleomenes, having lost his wits, cut his own flesh into pieces with a short sword, until by gradually mincing his whole body he destroyed himself. And Pythes continued fighting on his ship until he was entirely hacked to pieces. Such terms come at home at once to the vulgar reader, but their own vulgarity is redeemed by their expressiveness. Chapter 32 Concerning the number of metaphors to be employed together, Cecilius seems to give his vote with those critics who make a law that not more than two, or at at most three, should be combined in the same place. The use, however, must be determined by the occasion. Those outbursts of passion, which drive onwards like a winter torrent, draw with them as an indispensable accessory whole masses of metaphor. It is thus in that passage of Demosthenes, who here also is our safest guide. Those vile fawning wretches, each one of whom has lopped from his country her fairest members, who have toasted away their liberty, first to Philip, now to Alexander, who measure happiness by their belly and their vilest appetites, who have overthrown the old landmarks and standards of felicity among Greeks, to be free men, and to have no one for a master. Here the number of the metaphors is obscured by the orator's indignation against the betrayers of his country. And to effect this, Aristotle and Theophrastus recommend the softening of harsh metaphors by the use of some such phrase as, so to say, as it were, if I may be permitted the expression, if so bold a term is allowable. For to thus forestall criticism mitigates, they assert, the boldness of the metaphors and I will not deny that these have their use. Nevertheless, I must repeat the remark which I made in the case of figures, and maintain that there are native antidotes to the number and boldness of metaphors in well-timed displays of strong feeling, and in unaffected sublimity, because these have an innate power by the dash of their movement of sweeping along and carrying all else before them. Or should we not rather say that they absolutely demand as indispensable the use of daring metaphors, and will not allow the hearer to pause and criticize the number of them, because he shares the passions of the speaker. In the treatment, again, of familiar topics and in descriptive passages, nothing gives such distinctness as a close and continuous series of metaphors. It is by this means that Xenophon has so finely delineated the anatomy of the human frame, and there is still more brilliant and lifelike picture in Plato. The human head he calls a citadel, the neck is an isthmus set to divide it from the chest. To support it beneath are the vertebrae, turning like hinges. Pleasure he describes as a bait to tempt men to ill. The tongue is the arbiter of tastes. The heart is at once the knot of the veins and the source of the rapidly circulating blood, and is stationed in the guard room of the body. The ramifying blood vessels he calls alleys and casting about, he says, for something to sustain the violent palpitation of the heart when it is alarmed by the approach of danger, or agitated by passion, since at such times it is overheated, they, the gods, 
implanted in us the lungs, which are so fashioned that being soft and bloodless, and having cavities within, they act like a buffer, and when the heart boils with inward passion by yielding to its throbbing, save it from injury. He compares the seat of the desires to the women's quarters, the seat of the passions to the men's quarters, in a house. The spleen, again, is the napkin of the internal organs, by whose excretions it is saturated from time to time, and swells to a great size with inward impurity. After this, he continues, they shrouded the whole with flesh, throwing it forward like a cushion, as a barrier against injuries from without. The blood, he terms, the pasture of the flesh, to assist the process of nutrition, he goes on. They divided the body into ducts, cutting trenches like those in a garden, so that the body being a system of narrow conduits, the current of the veins might flow as from a perennial fountainhead. And when the end is at hand, he says, the soul is cast loose from her moorings like a ship, and free to wander whither she will. These and a hundred similar fancies follow one another in quick succession. But those which I have pointed out are sufficient to demonstrate how great is the natural power of figurative language, and how largely metaphors conduce to sublimity, and to illustrate the important part which they play in all impassioned and descriptive passages. That the use of figurative language, as of all other beauties of style, has a constant tendency towards excess, is an obvious truth which I need not dwell upon. It is chiefly on this account that even Plato comes in for a large share of disparagement, because he is often carried away by a sort of frenzy of language into an intemperate use of violent metaphors and inflated allegory. It is not easy to remark, he says in one place, that a city ought to be blended like a bowl, in which the mad wine boils when it is poured out, but being disciplined by another and a sober god in that fair society produces a good and temperate drink. Really, it is said, to speak of water as a sober god, and of the process of mixing as a discipline, is to talk like a poet, and no very sober one either. It was such defects as these that the hostile critic Cecilius made his ground of attack, when he had the boldness in his essay On the Beauties of Lysias to pronounce that writer superior in every respect to Plato. Now Cecilius was doubly unqualified for a judge, he loved Lysias better even than himself, and at the same time his hatred of Plato and all his works is greater even than his love for Lysias. Moreover, he is so blind a partisan that his very premises are open to dispute. He vaunts Lysias as a faultless and immaculate writer, while Plato is, according to him, full of blemishes. Now this is not the case. Far from it. End of section 11Section 12 of On the Sublime. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. On the Sublime by Longinus. Translated by H. L. Havel. Chapters 33 and 34. Chapter 33. But supposing now that we assume the existence of a really unblemished and irreproachable writer, is it not worth while to raise the whole question whether in poetry and prose we should prefer sublimity accompanied by some faults, or a style which never rising above moderate excellence, never stumbles and never requires correction? And again, whether the first place in literature is justly to be assigned to the more numerous or the loftier excellences, for these are questions proper to an inquiry on the sublime, and urgently asking for settlement. I know, then, that the largest intellects are far from being the most exact. A mind always intent on correctness is apt to be dissipated in trifles, but in great affluence of thought, as in vast material wealth, there must needs be an occasional neglect of detail. And is it not inevitably so? Is it not by risking nothing, by never aiming high, that a writer of low or middling powers keeps generally clear of faults and secure of blame, whereas the loftier walks of literature are by their very loftiness perilous? I am well aware, again, that there is a law by which in all human productions the weak points catch the eye first, 
by which their faults remain indelibly stamped on the memory, while their beauties quickly fade away. Yet, though I have myself noted not a few faulty passages in Homer and in other authors of the highest rank, and though I am far from being partial to their failings, nevertheless I would call them not so much willful blunders as oversights which were allowed to pass unregarded through that contempt of little things, that brave disorder, which is natural to an exalted genius. And I still think that the greater excellences, though not everywhere equally sustained, ought always to be voted to the first place in literature, if for no other reason for the mere grandeur of soul they evince. Let us take an instance. Apollonius, in his Argonautica, has given us a poem actually faultless, and in his pastoral poetry Theocritus is eminently happy, except when he occasionally attempts another style. And what then? Would you rather be a Homer or an Apollonius? Or take Eratosthenes and his Erigone. Because that little work is without a flaw, is he therefore a greater poet than Archilochus, with all his disorderly profusion? greater than that impetuous, that God-gifted genius, which chafed against the restraints of law? Or in lyric poetry, would you choose to be a Bacchylides or a Pindar? In tragedy, a Sophocles, or, save the mark, an Io of Chios. Yet Io and Bacchylides never stumble. Their style is always neat, always pretty, while Pindar and Sophocles sometimes move onwards with a wide blaze of splendor, but often drop out of view in sudden and disastrous eclipse. Nevertheless, no one in his senses would deny that a single play of Sophocles, the Oedipus, is of higher value than all the dramas of Io put together. Chapter 34 If the number and not the loftiness of an author's merits is to be our standard of success, judged by this test we must admit that Hyperides is a far superior orator to Demosthenes, for in Hyperides there is a richer modulation, a greater variety of excellence. He is, we may say, in everything second best, like the champion of the pentathlon, who, though in every contest he has to yield the prize to some other combatant, is superior to the unpractised in all five. Not only has he rivaled the success of Demosthenes in everything but his manner of composition, but as though that were not enough, he has taken in all the excellences and graces of Lysias as well. He knows when it is proper to speak with simplicity, and does not, like Demosthenes, continue the same key throughout. His touches of character are racy and sparkling, and full of a delicate flavor. Then how admirable is his wit, how polished his raillery, how well-bred he is, how dexterous in the use of irony. His jests are pointed, but without any of the grossness and vulgarity of the old Attic comedy. He is skilled in making light of an opponent's argument, full of a well-aimed satire which amuses while it stings, and through all this there runs a pervading, may we not say, a matchless charm. He is most apt in moving compassion. His mythical digressions show a fluent ease, and he is perfect in bending his course and finding a way out of them without violence or effort. Thus, when he tells the story of Leto, he is really almost a poet, and his funeral oration shows a declamatory magnificence to which I hardly know a parallel. Demosthenes, on the other hand, has no touches of character, none of the versatility, fluency, or declamatory skill of Hyperides. He is, in fact, almost entirely destitute of all those excellences which I have just enumerated. When he makes violent efforts to be humorous and witty, the only laughter he arouses is against himself. And the nearer he tries to get to the winning grace of Hyperides, the farther he recedes from it. Had he, for instance, attempted such a task as the little speech in defense of Firna or Athenagoras, he would have only added to the reputation of his rival. Nevertheless, all the beauties of Hyperides, however numerous, cannot make him sublime. He never exhibits strong feeling, has little energy, rouses no emotion. Certainly he never kindles terror in the breast of his readers. But Demosthenes followed a great master, and drew his consummate excellences, his high-pitched eloquence, his living passion, his copiousness, his sagacity, his speed, that mastery and power which can never be approached, 
from the highest of sources. These mighty, these heaven-sent gifts, I dare not call them human, he made his own, both one and all. Therefore, I say, by the noble qualities which he does possess, he remains supreme above all rivals, and throws a cloud over his failings, silencing by his thunders and blinding by his lightnings the orators of all ages. Yes, it would be easier to meet the lightning stroke with steady eye than to gaze unmoved when his impassioned eloquence is sending out flash after flash. End of section 12 Section 13 of On the Sublime. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. On the Sublime by Longinus. Translated by H. L. Havel. Chapters 35 through 38. Chapter 35. But in the case of Plato and Lysias, there is, as I said, a further difference. Not only is Lysias vastly inferior to Plato in the degree of his merits, but in their number as well, and at the same time he is as far ahead of Plato in the number of his faults as he is behind in that of his merits. What truth, then, was it that was present to those mighty spirits of the past, who, making whatever is greatest in writing their aim, thought it beneath them to be exact in every detail? among many others especially this that it was not in nature's plan for us her chosen children to be creatures base and ignoble no she brought us into life and into the whole universe as into some great field of contest that we should be at once spectators and ambitious rivals of her mighty deeds and from the first implanted in our souls an invincible yearning for all that is great all that is diviner than ourselves Therefore, even the whole world is not wide enough for the soaring range of human thought, but man's mind often overleaps the very bounds of space. When we survey the whole circle of life, and see it abounding everywhere in what is elegant, grand, and beautiful, we learn at once what is the true end of man's being. And this is why nature prompts us to admire, not the clearness and usefulness of a little stream, but the Nile, the Danube, the Rhine, and far beyond all, the ocean, not to turn our wandering eyes from the heavenly fires, though often darkened, to the little flame kindled by human hands, however pure and steady its light, not to think that tiny lamp more wondrous than the caverns of Etna, from whose raging depths are hurled up stones and whole masses of rock, and torrents sometimes come pouring from earth's centre of pure and living fire. To sum the whole, Whatever is useful or needful lies easily within man's reach, but he keeps his homage for what is astounding. Chapter 36 How much more do these principles apply to the sublime in literature, where grandeur is never, as it sometimes is in nature, dissociated from utility and advantage? Therefore all those who have achieved it, however far from faultless, are still more than mortal, when a writer uses any other resource, he shows himself to be a man, but the sublime lifts him near to the great spirit of the deity. He who makes no slips must be satisfied with negative approbation, but he who is sublime commands positive reverence. Why need I add that each one of those great writers often redeems all his errors by one grand and masterly stroke? But the strongest point of all is that if you were to pick out all the blunders of Homer, Demosthenes, Plato, and all the greatest names in literature, and add them together, they would be found to bear a very small, or rather an infinitesimal, proportion to the passages in which these supreme masters have attained absolute perfection. Therefore, it is that all posterity, whose judgment envy herself cannot impeach, has brought and bestowed on them the crown of glory, and has guarded their fame until this day against all attack, and is likely to preserve it, as long as lofty trees shall grow, and restless waters seaward flow. It has been urged by one writer that we should not prefer the huge disproportioned Colossus to the Doriphorus of Polycletus. But, to give one out of many possible answers, in art we admire exactness, in the works of nature, magnificence, 
and it is from nature that man derives the faculty of speech. Whereas, then, in statuary we look for close resemblance to humanity, in literature we require something which transcends humanity. Nevertheless, to reiterate the advice which we gave at the beginning of this essay, since that success which consists in avoidance of error is usually the gift of art, while high, though unequal, excellence is the attribute of genius, it is proper on all occasions to call in art as an ally to nature. By the combined resources of these two we may hope to achieve perfection. Such are the conclusions which were forced upon me concerning the points at issue, but every one may consult his own taste. Chapter 37 To return, however, from this long digression, closely allied to metaphors are comparisons and similes, differing only in this. Missing Text Chapter 38 Such absurdities as, unless you carry your brains next to the ground in your heels. Hence it is necessary to know where to draw the line, for if ever it is overstepped, the effect of hyperbole is spoilt, being in such cases relaxed by overstraining, and producing the very opposite to the effect desired. Isocrates, for instance, from an ambitious desire of lending everything a strong rhetorical colouring, shows himself in quite a childish light, having in his panegyrical oration set himself to prove that the Athenian state has surpassed that of Sparta in her services to Hellas. He starts off, at the very outset, with these words, Such is the power of language that it can extenuate what is great and lend greatness to what is little, give freshness to what is antiquated, and describe what is recent so that it seems to be of the past. Come, Isocrates, it might be asked, is it thus that you are going to tamper with the facts about Sparta and Athens? This flourish about the power of language is like a signal hung out to warn his audience not to believe him. We may repeat here what we said about figures, and say that the hyperbole is then most effective when it appears in disguise, and this effect is produced when a writer, impelled by strong feeling, speaks in the accents of some tremendous crisis, as Thucydides does in describing the massacre in Sicily. The Syracusans, he says, went down after them, and slew those especially who were in the river, and the water was at once defiled, yet still they went on drinking it, though mingled with mud and gore, most of them even fighting for it. The drinking of mud and gore, and even the fighting for it, is made credible by the awful horror of the scene described. Similarly, Herodotus, on those who fell at Thermopylae. Here, as they fought, those who still had them with daggers, the rest with hands and teeth, the barbarians buried them under their javelins that they fought with the teeth against heavy-armed assailants, and that they were buried with javelins, are perhaps hard sayings, but not incredible, for the reasons already explained. We can see that these circumstances have not been dragged in to produce a hyperbole, but that the hyperbole has grown naturally out of the circumstances. For, as I am never tired of explaining, in actions and passions verging on frenzy there lies a kind of remission and palliation of any license of language, Hence some comic extravagances, however improbable, gain credence by their humour, such as, He had a farm, a little farm, where space severely pinches. T'was smaller than the last dispatch from Sparta by some inches. For mirth is one of the passions having its seat in pleasure, and hyperboles may be employed either to increase or to lessen, since exaggeration is common to both uses. Thus, in extenuating an opponent's argument, we try to make it seem smaller than it is. End of section 13 Section 14 of On the Sublime This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley on the Sublime by Longinus, translated by H. L. Havel, chapters thirty nine through forty two. Chapter thirty nine. We have still left, my dear sir, the fifth of those sources which we set down at the outset as contributing to sublimity, that which consists in the mere arrangement of words in a certain order. 
having already published two books dealing fully with this subject so far at least as our investigations had carried us it will be sufficient for the purpose of our present inquiry to add that harmony is an instrument which has a natural power not only to win and to delight but also in a remarkable degree to exalt the soul and sway the heart of man when we see that a flute kindles certain emotions in its hearers rendering them almost beside themselves and full of an orgiastic frenzy and that by starting some kind of rhythmical beat it compels him who listens to move in time and assimilate his gestures to the tune even though he has no taste whatsoever for music when we know that the sounds of a harp which in themselves have no meaning by the change of key by the mutual relation of the notes and their arrangement in symphony often lay a wonderful spell on an audience though these are mere shadows and spurious imitations of persuasion not as i have said genuine manifestations of human nature can we doubt that composition being a kind of harmony of that language which nature has taught us and which reaches not our ears only but our very souls when it raises changing forms of words of thoughts of actions of beauty of melody all of which are ingrained in and akin to ourselves and when by the blending of its manifold tones it brings home to the minds of those who stand by the feelings present to the speaker and ever disposes the hearer to sympathize with those feelings adding word to word until it has raised a majestic and harmonious structure can we wonder if all this enchants us wherever we meet with it and filling us with a sense of pomp and dignity and sublimity and whatever else it embraces gains a complete mastery over our minds it would be mere infatuation to join issue on truth so universally acknowledged and established by experience beyond dispute now to give an instance that is doubtless a sublime thought indeed wonderfully fine which demosthenes applies to his decree tuto to psvisima ton tote ti poli peristanda kinthinon perelthin epiesin ausper nephos this decree caused the danger which then hung round our city to pass away like a cloud but the modulation is as perfect as the sentiment itself is weighty it is uttered wholly in the dactylic measure the noblest and most magnificent of all measures and hence forming the chief constituent in the finest metre we know the heroic and it is with great judgment that the words ausper nephos are reserved till the end footnote there is a break here in the text but the context indicates the sense of the words lost which has accordingly been supplied end of footnote supposing we transpose them from their proper place and read say tuto ta psvisma ausper nephos epise ton tote kintinon parelthin nay let us merely cut off one syllable reading epise parelthin aus nephos and you will understand how close is the unison between harmony and sublimity in the passage before us the words ausper nephos move first in a heavy measure which is metrically equivalent to four short syllables but on removing one syllable and reading aus nephos the grandeur of movement is at once crippled by the abridgment so conversely if you lengthen it into ausperi nephos the meaning is still the same but it does not strike the ear in the same manner because by lingering over the final syllables you at once dissipate and relax the abrupt grandeur of the passage chapter forty there is another method very efficient in exalting a style as the different members of the body none of which if severed from its connection has any intrinsic excellence unite by their mutual combination to form a complete and perfect organism so also the elements of a fine passage by whose separation from one another its high quality is simultaneously dissipated and evaporates when joined in one organic whole and still further compacted by the bond of harmony by the mere rounding of the period gain power of tone in fact a clause may be said to derive its sublimity from the joint contributions of a number of particulars and further as we have shown at large elsewhere many writers in prose and verse though their natural powers were not high were perhaps even low 
and though the terms they employed were usually common and popular, and conveying no impression of refinement, by the mere harmony of their composition, have attained dignity and elevation, and avoided the appearances of meanness. Such among many others are Philistus, Aristophanes, occasionally, Euripides almost always. Thus, when Heracles says, after the murder of his children, I'm full of woes, I have no room for more, the words are quite common, but they are made sublime by being cast in a fine mould. By changing their position, you will see that the poetical quality of Euripides depends more on his arrangement than on his thoughts. Compare his lines on Dirce dragged by the bull. Whatever crossed his path, caught in his victim's form, he seized, and dragging oak, woman, rock, now here, now there, he flies. The circumstance is noble in itself, but it gains in vigor because the language is disposed so as not to hurry the movement, not running, as it were, on wheels, because there is a distinct stress on each word, and the time is delayed, advancing slowly to a pitch of stately sublimity. Chapter 41 Nothing so much degrades the tone of a style as an effeminate and hurried movement in the language, such as is produced by pyrrhics and trochies and dickories falling in time together, into a regular dance measure. Such abuse of rhythm is sure to savor of coxcombry and petty affectation, and grows tiresome in the highest degree by a monotonous sameness of tone. But its worst effect is that as those who listen to a ballad have their attention distracted from its subject, and can think of nothing but the tune, so an over-rhythmical passage does not affect the hearer by the meaning of its words, but merely by their cadence, so that sometimes knowing where the pause must come, they beat time with the speaker, striking the expected close like dancers before the stop is reached. Equally undignified is the splitting up of a sentence into a number of little words and short syllables crowded too closely together and forced into cohesion, hammered, as it were, successively together, after the manner of mortise and tenon. Chapter 42 Sublimity is further diminished by cramping the diction. Deformity instead of grandeur ensues from over-compression. Here I am not referring to a judicious compactness of phrase, but to a style which is dwarfed and is force frittered away. To cut your words too short is to prune away their sense, but to be concise is to be direct. On the other hand, we know that a style becomes lifeless by overextension. I mean by being relaxed to an unseasonable length. End of section 14Section 15 of On the Sublime. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. On the Sublime by Longinus. Translated by H. L. Havel. Chapters 43 and 44. Chapter 43. The use of mean words has also a strong tendency to degrade a lofty passage. Thus, in that description of the storm in Herodotus, the matter is admirable, but some of the words admitted are beneath the dignity of the subject, such perhaps as the seas having seethed, because the ill-sounding phrase having seethed detracts much from its impressiveness, or when he says the wind wore away, and those who clung round the wrecked met with an unwelcome end. War away is innoble and vulgar, and unwelcome inadequate to the extent of the disaster. Similarly, Theopompus, after giving a fine picture of the Persian king's descent against Egypt, has exposed the whole to censure by certain paltry expressions. There was no city, no people of Asia, which did not send an embassy to the king, no product of the earth, no work of art, whether beautiful or precious, which was not among the gifts brought to him. Many and costly were the hangings and robes, some purple, some embroidered, some white, many the tents of cloth of gold, furnished with all things useful, many the tapestries and couches of great price. Moreover, there was gold and silver plate richly wrought, goblets and bowls, some of which might be seen studded with gems, and others besides worked in relief with great skill and at vast expense. Besides these there were suits of armor, in number past computation, partly Greek, 
partly foreign, endless trains of baggage animals and fat cattle for slaughter, many bushels of spices, many panniers and sacks and sheets of writing paper, and all other necessaries in the same proportion. And there was salt meat of all kinds of beasts in immense quantity, heaped together to such a height as to show at a distance like mounds and hills thrown up one against another. He runs off from the grander parts of his subject to the meaner, and sinks where he ought to rise. Still worse, by his mixing up panniers and spices and bags with his wonderful recital of that vast and busy scene, one would imagine that he was describing a kitchen. Let us suppose that in that show of magnificence someone had taken a set of wretched baskets and bags and placed them in the midst among vessels of gold jeweled bowls, silver plate, and tents and goblets of gold. How incongruous would have seemed the effect! Now, just in the same way, these petty words, introduced out of season, stand out like deformities and blots on the diction. These details might have been given in one or two broad strokes, as when he speaks of mounds being heaped together. So, in dealing with the other preparations, he might have told us of wagons and camels and a long train of baggage animals, loaded with all kinds of supplies for the luxury and enjoyment of the table, or have mentioned piles of grain of every species, and of all the choicest delicacies required by the art of the cook or the taste of the epicure. Or, if he must needs be so very precise, he might have spoken of whatever dainties are supplied by those who lay or those who dress the banquet. In our sublimer efforts, we should never stoop to what is sordid and despicable, unless very hard-pressed by some urgent necessity. If we would write becomingly, our utterance should be worthy of our theme. We should take a lesson from nature, who, when she planned the human frame, did not set out our grosser parts, or the ducts for purging the body, in our face, but, as far as she could, concealed them, diverting, as Xenophon says, those canals as far as possible from our senses, and thus shunning in any part to mar the beauty of the whole creature. However, it is not incumbent on us to specify and enumerate whatever diminishes a style. We have now pointed out the various means of giving it nobility and loftiness. It is clear, then, that whatever is contrary to these will generally degrade and deform it. Chapter 44 There is still another point which remains to be cleared up, my dear Terentian, and on which I shall not hesitate to add some remarks, to gratify your inquiring spirit. It relates to a question which was recently put to me by a certain philosopher. To me, he said, in common, I may say with many others, it is a matter of wonder that in the present age, which produces many highly skilled in the arts of popular persuasion, many of keen and active powers, many especially rich in every pleasing gift of language, the growth of highly exalted and wide-reaching genius has, with a few rare exceptions, almost entirely ceased. So universal is the dearth of eloquence, which prevails throughout the world. Must we really, he asked, give credit to that oft-repeated assertion that democracy is the kind nurse of genius, and that high literary excellence has flourished with her prime and faded with her decay? Liberty, it is said, is all-powerful to feed the aspirations of high intellects, to hold out hope, and keep alive the flame of mutual rivalry and ambitious struggle for the highest place. Moreover, the prizes which are offered in every free state keep the spirits of her foremost orators wedded by perpetual exercise. They are, as it were, ignited by friction, and naturally blaze forth freely because they are surrounded by freedom. But we of today, he continued, seem to have learnt in our childhood the lessons of a benignant despotism, to have been cradled in her habits and customs from the time when our minds were still tender and never to have tasted the fairest and most fruitful fountain of eloquence, I mean liberty. Hence we develop nothing but a fine genius for flattery. This is the reason why, although all other faculties are consistent with the servile condition, no slave ever became an orator, because in him there is a dumb spirit which will not be kept down. His soul is chained. He is like one who has learnt to ever be expecting a blow. For, as Homer says, the day of slavery takes half our manly worth away. As, then, if what I have heard is credible, the cages in which those pygmies commonly called dwarfs are reared not only stop the growth of the imprisoned creature, 
but absolutely make him smaller by compressing every part of his body, so all despotism, however equitable, may be defined as a cage of the soul and a general prison. My answer was as follows. My dear friend, it is so easy and so characteristic of human nature always to find fault with the present. Consider now whether the corruption of genius is to be attributed not to a worldwide peace, but rather to the war within us which knows no limit, which engages all our desires, yes, and still further to the bad passions which lay siege to us today and make utter havoc and spoil of our lives. Footnote. A worldwide peace is a euphemism for a worldwide tyranny. End of footnote. Are we not enslaved, nay, are not our careers completely shipwrecked by love of gain, that fever which rages unappeased in us all, and love of pleasure, one the most debasing, the other the most ennoble of the mind's diseases? When I consider it, I can find no means by which we, who hold in such high honor, or to speak more correctly, who idolize boundless riches, can close the door of our souls against those evil spirits which grow up with them. For wealth unmeasured and unbridled is dogged by extravagance. She sticks close to him and treads in his footsteps, and as soon as he opens the gates of cities or of houses, she enters with him and makes her abode with him. And after a time they build their nests, to use a wise man's words, in that corner of life and speedily set about breeding and beget boastfulness and vanity and wantonness, no base-born children but their very own. And if these also, the offspring of wealth, be allowed to come to their prime, quickly they engender in the soul those pitiless tyrants of violence and lawlessness and shamelessness. Whenever a man takes to worshipping what is mortal and irrational in him, and neglects to cherish what is immortal, these are the inevitable results. He never looks up again, he has lost all care for good report. By slow degrees the ruin of his life goes on until it is consummated all around. All that is great in his soul fades, withers away, and is despised. If a judge who passes sentence for a bribe can never more give a free and sound decision on a point of justice or honor, for to him who takes a bribe honor and justice must be measured by his own interests, how can we of today expect when the whole life of each one of us is controlled by bribery, while we lie in wait for other men's death and plan how to get a place in their wills, when we buy gain from whatever source, each one of us with our very souls in our slavish greed, how, I say, can we expect in the midst of such a moral pestilence that there is still left even one liberal and impartial critic whose verdict will not be biased by avarice in judging of those great works which live on through all time? Alas, I fear that for such men as we are, it is better to serve than to be free. If our appetites were let loose altogether against our neighbors, they would be like wild beasts, uncaged, and bring a deluge of calamity on the whole civilized world. I ended by remarking generally that the genius of the present age is wasted by that indifference which, with a few exceptions, runs through the whole of life. If we ever shake off our apathy and apply ourselves to work, it is always with a view to pleasure or applause, not for that solid advantage which is worthy to be striven for and held in honor. We had better then leave this generation to its fate, and turn to what follows, which is the subject of the passions, to which we promised early in this treatise to devote a separate work. They play an important part in literature generally, and especially in relation to the sublime. End of section 15 Section 16 of On the Sublime. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesney. On the Sublime by Longinus. Translated by H. L. Havel. Appendix. Some account of the less known writers mentioned in the treatise On the Sublime. Ammonius. Alexandrian grammarian carried on the school of Aristarchus, previously to the reign of Augustus. The allusion here is to a work on the passages in which Plato has imitated Homer. Amphicrates. 
author of a book on famous men, referred to by Athenius and Diogenes Laertius. C. Mueller considers him to be the Athenian rhetorician who, according to Plutarch, retired to Seleucia and closed his life at the court of Cleopatra, daughter of Mithridates and wife of Tigranes. Plutarch tells a story illustrative of his arrogance. Being asked by the Seleucians to open a school of rhetoric, he replied, A dish is not large enough for a dolphin. Aristius, a name involved in a mist of fable. According to Suidas, he was a contemporary of Croesus, though Herodotus assigns to him a much remoter antiquity. The latter authority describes him as visiting the northern peoples of Europe and recording his travels in an epic poem, a fragment of which is given here by Longinus. The passage before us appears to be intended as the words of some Aramaspian, who, as belonging to a remote inland race, expresses his astonishment that any men could be found bold enough to commit themselves to the mercy of the sea, and tries to describe the terror of human beings placed in such a situation. Bacchylides, nephew and pupil of the great Simonides, flourished about 460 B.C., he followed his uncle to the court of Hero at Syracuse, and enjoyed the patronage of that despot. After Hero's death, he returned to his home in Chios, but finding himself discontented with the mode of life pursued in a free Greek community, for which his experiences at Hero's court may well have disqualified him, he retired to Peloponnesus, where he died. His works comprise specimens of almost every kind of lyric composition, as practiced by the Greeks of his time. Horace is said to have imitated him in his prophecy of Nereus. So far as we can judge from what remains of his works, he was distinguished rather by elegance than by force. A considerable fragment on the blessings of peace has been translated by Mr. J. A. Simmons in his work on the Greek poets. He has made the subject of a very bitter allusion by Pindar. We may suppose that the stern and lofty spirit of Pindar had little sympathy with the tearful strains of Simonides or his imitators. Sicilius, a native of Cale Acte in Sicily, and hence known as Sicilius Calactinus, lived in Rome at the time of Augustus. He is mentioned with distinction as a learned Greek rhetorician and grammarian, and was the author of numerous works, frequently referred to by Plutarch and other later writers. He may be regarded as one of the most distinguished Greek rhetoricians of his time. His works, all of which have perished, comprised, among many others, commentaries on Antipho and Lysias, several treaties on Demosthenes, among which is a dissertation on the genuine and spurious speeches, and another comparing that orator with Cicero, on the distinction between Athenian and Asiatic eloquence, and the work on the sublime referred to by Longinus. The criticism of Longinus on the above work may be thus summed up. Sicilius is censured, first, as failing to rise to the dignity of his subject, second, as missing the cardinal points, and third, as failing in practical utility. He wastes his energy in tedious attempts to define the sublime, but does not tell us how it is to be attained. He is further blamed for omitting to deal with the pathetic. He allows only two metaphors to be employed together in the same passage. He extols Lysias as a far greater writer than Plato, and is a bitter assailant of Plato's style. On the whole, he seems to have been a cold and uninspired critic, finding his chief pleasure in minute verbal details, and incapable of rising to an elevated and extensive view of his subject. Eratosthenes, a native of Cyrene, born in 275 B.C., Appointed by Ptolemy the Third Irrigetes as the successor of Callimachus in the post of librarian in the great library of Alexandria. He was the teacher of Aristophanes of Byzantium, and his fame as a man of learning is testified by the various fanciful titles which were conferred on him, such as the Pentathlete, the Second Plato, etc. His great work was a treatise on geography. Gorgias of Leontini according to some authorities a pupil of empedocles came when already advanced in years as ambassador from his native city to ask help against syracuse four twenty seven b c here he attracted notice by a novel style of eloquence some time after he settled permanently in greece 
wandering from city to city and acquiring wealth and fame by practicing and teaching rhetoric. We find him last in La Risa, where he died at the age of a hundred in 375 B.C. As a teacher of eloquence, Gorgias belongs to what is known as the Sicilian school, in which he followed the steps of his predecessors Corax and Tisius. At the time when this school arose, the Greek ear was still accustomed to the rhythm and beat of poetry, and the whole rhetorical system of the Gorgian school. Compare the phrases Gorgia schemata, Gorgia zin, is built on a poetical plan. Hermogenes, as quoted by Jean, appears to classify him among the hollow pedants, who, he says, talk of vultures as living tombs, to which they themselves would best be committed, and indulge in many other frigid conceits. With the metaphor accentuated by Longinus, compare Achilles Tatius, chapter 3, verse 50. See also Plato, Phaedrus, 267a. Hegesius of Magnesia, rhetorician and historian, contemporary of Timaeus, 300 BC. He belongs to the period of the decline of Greek learning, and Cicero treats him as the representative of the decline of taste. His style was harsh and broken in character, and a parody on the old Attic. He wrote A Life of Alexander the Great, of which Plutarch gives the following specimen. On the day of Alexander's birth, the temple of Artemis in Ephesus was burnt down, a coincidence which occasions Hegesius to utter a conceit frigid enough to extinguish the conflagration. It was natural, he says, that the temple should be burnt down, as Artemis was engaged with bringing Alexander into the world. Hecateus of Miletus, the logographer, born in 549 BC, died soon after the Battle of Plataea. He was the author of two works, Periodos Ges and Yenaloia. The Periodos deals in two books, first with Europe, then with Asia and Libya. The quotation in the text is from his genealogies. Eon of Chios, poet, historian, and philosopher, highly distinguished among his contemporaries, and mentioned by Strabo among the celebrated men of the island. He won the tragic prize at Athens in 452 BC, and Aristophanes speaks of him as already dead. He was not less celebrated as an elegiac poet, and we still possess some specimens of his elegies, which are characterized by an anacreatonic spirit, a cheerful, joyous tone, and even by a certain degree of inspiration. He wrote also scolia, hymns, and epigrams, and was a pretty voluminous writer in prose. Compare the scoliast on Aristophanes' Peace, 1801. Callisthenes of Olynthus, a near relative of Aristotle, born in 360 and educated by the philosopher as fellow pupil with Alexander, afterwards the great. He subsequently visited Athens, where he enjoyed the friendship of Theophrastus and devoted himself to history and natural philosophy. He afterwards accompanied Alexander on his Asiatic expedition, but soon became obnoxious to the tyrant on account of his independent and manly bearing, which he carried even to the extreme of rudeness and arrogance. He at last excited the enmity of Alexander to such a degree that the latter took the opportunity afforded by the conspiracy of Hermolaus, in which Callisthenes was accused of participating, to rid himself of his former school companion, whom he caused to be put to death. He was the author of various historical and scientific works. Of the latter two are mentioned. 1. On the Nature of the Eye. 2. On the Nature of Plants. Among his historical works are mentioned, first, The Phocian War, to A History of Greece in Ten Books, and three, Ta Persica, apparently identical with the description of Alexander's march, of which we still possess fragments. As an historian, he seems to have displayed an undue love of recording signs and wonders. Polybius, however, classes him among the best historical writers. His style is said by Cicero to approximate to the rhetorical. Cleotarchus, a contemporary of Alexander, accompanied that monarch on his Asiatic expedition, and wrote a history of the same in twelve books, which must have included at least a short retrospect on the early history of Asia. His talents are spoken of in high terms, but his credit as an historian is held very light. Probator ingenium fides inflammatur. Cicero also ranks him very low. 
that his credit as an historian was sacrificed to a childish credulity and a foolish love of fable and adventure is sufficiently testified by the pretty numerous fragments which still remain demetrius phalerius quoted by pierce quotes a grandiloquent description of the wasp taken from cleotarchus feeding on the mountainside her home the hollow oak matris a native of thebes author of a panegyric on heracles whether in verse or prose is uncertain in one passage athenius speaks of him as an athenian but this must be a mistake Toop restores a verse from an allusion in Didorius Siculus, which, if genuine, would agree well with the description given of him by Longinus. Heraclea Kaleaskein hote gleos esca dia heron. Philistus of Syracuse, a relative of the elder Dionysus, whom he assisted with his wealth in his attack on the liberty of that city, and remained with him until 386 B.C., when he was banished by the jealous suspicions of the tyrant. He retired to Epirus, where he remained until Dionysus's death. The younger Dionysus recalled him, wishing to employ him in the character of supporter against Dion. By his instrumentality, it would seem that Dion and Plato were banished from Syracuse. He commanded the fleet in the struggle between Dion and Dionysus, and lost a battle, whereupon he was seized and put to death by the people. During his banishment, he wrote his historical work, Tessikilika, divided into two parts and numbering eleven books. The first division embraced the history of Sicily from the earliest times down to the capture of Argentum, seven books, and the remaining four books dealt with the life of Dionysus the Elder. He afterwards added a supplement in two books, giving an account of the younger Dionysus, which he did not, however, complete. He is described as an imitator, though at a great distance, of Thucydides, and hence was known as the Little Thucydides. As an historian, he is deficient in conscientiousness and candor. He appears as a partisan of Dionysus, and seeks to throw a veil over his discreditable actions. Still, he belongs to the most important of the Greek historians. Theodorus of Gadara, a rhetorician in the first century after Christ, tutor of Tiberius, first in Rome, afterwards in Rhodes, from which town he called himself a Rhodian, and where Tiberius, during his exile, diligently attended his instruction. He was the author of various grammatical and other works, but his fame chiefly rested on his abilities as a teacher, in which capacity he seems to have had great influence. He was the author of that famous description of Tiberius, which is given by Suetonius, a clod kneaded together with blood. Footnote. A remarkable parallel, if not actually an imitation, occurs in Goethe's Faust, Du Spottgebirt von Treck und Feuer. End of footnote. Theopompus, a native of Chios, born 380 BC. He came to Athens while still a boy, and studied eloquence under Isocrates, who was said, in comparing him with another pupil, Ephorus, to have made use of the image which we find in Longinus. The Apompus, he said, needs the curb, Ephorus the spur. He appeared with applause in various great cities as an advocate, but especially distinguished himself in the contest of eloquence instituted by Artemisia at the obsequies of her husband Mausolus, where he won the prize. He afterwards devoted himself to historical composition. His great work was A History of Greece, in which he takes up the thread of Thucydides' narrative, and carries it on uninterruptedly in twelve books down to the Battle of Cnidus, seventeen years later. Here he broke off and began a new work entitled The Philippics in fifty-eight books. This work dealt with the history of Greece in the Macedonian period, but was padded out to a preposterous bulk by all kinds of digressions on mythological, historical, or social topics. Only a few fragments remain. He earned an ill name among ancient critics by the bitterness of his censures, his love of the marvelous, and the inordinate length of his digressions. His style is by some critics censured as feeble, and extolled by others as clear, nervous, and elevated. Timaeus, native of Tauromenium in Sicily, born about 352 BC. Being driven out of Sicily by Agathocles, he lived a retired life for fifty years in Athens, where he composed his history. 
Subsequently, he returned to Sicily and died at the age of 96 in 256 BC. His chief work was a history of Sicily from the earliest times down to the 129th Olympiad. It numbered 68 books and consisted of two principal divisions, whose limits cannot now be ascertained. In a separate work, he handled the campaigns of Pyrrhus, and also wrote Olympionicae, probably dealing with chronological matters. Timaeus has been severely criticized and harshly condemned by the ancients, especially by Polybius, who denies him every faculty required by the historical writer. And though Cicero differs from this judgment, yet it may be regarded as certain that Timaeus was better qualified for the task of learned compilation than for historical research, and held no distinguished place among the historians of Greece. His works have perished, only a few fragments remaining. Zoilus, a Greek rhetorician native of Amphipolis in Macedonia, in the time probably of Ptolemy Philadelphus, 285 to 247 BC, who is said by Vitruvius to have crucified him for his abuse of Homer. He won the name of Homeromastix, the scourge of Homer, and was also known as the dog of rhetoric on account of his biting sarcasm, and his name, as in the case of the English Dennis, came to be used to signify in general a carping and malicious critic. Suidas mentions two works of his, written with the object of injuring or destroying the fame of Homer. First, nine books against Homer, and second, censures on Homer. The facts contained in the above short notices are taken chiefly from Lübker's Ria Lexicon des Klassischen Altertums, and the various copious and elaborate Real Encyclopedia der Klassischen Altertums Wissenschaft, edited by Pauli. I have here to acknowledge the kindness of Dr. Wolseifen, gymnasial director in Krefeld, in placing at my disposal the library of the Krefeld Gymnasium, but for which these biographical notes, which were put together at the suggestion of Mr. Lang, could not have been compiled. Krefeld, 31st July, 1890. The End Printed by R. and R. Clark, Edinburgh. End of section 16. End of On the Sublime by Longinus. Translated by H. L. Havel. Read by Amelia Chesley.